Dr. Mace Rothenberg. He's joining us from Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Steve. First of all, explain your role in the development of this vaccine. Well, for the past two years, I was a chief medical officer for Pfizer. I've since retired. Um, and our group was very involved in making sure um, that information about the vaccine uh, was complete uh, and accurate uh, and up to date to make sure people who were either offering the vaccine or receiving the vaccine had the information they need to make the right decision. Uh, my group was also involved in making sure that the safety uh, was monitored very, very carefully within the clinical trials as well as after the clinical trials because remember many more people will receive the vaccine after the clinical trials than actually before the, the drug received emergency use authorization. So that, that, that monitoring after a medicine reaches the general public is called pharmacovigilance and that was squarely in, in the responsibility of my organization. I want to ask you about some news on this Monday, and this is the headline from CNBC. Based on a study that took place in Israel, the COVID variant, which is coming from South Africa, one of these new strains that is causing so much concern, was able to break through the Pfizer vaccine. The story points out that it was able to evade some of the protections in the vaccine. Explain the story and the significance of this in terms of how we deal with these variants. Right. When we hear about a variant having resistance to the vaccine, we have to really understand where that information is coming from, because a lot of it to date has come from the laboratory. And what that has shown is that some of these variants require a higher concentration of antibody to be killed. But the level of antibody that's generated by the vaccine is so much higher than that, then that really has no clinical significance. These recent reports now indicate that in some cases, the, the level of antibodies achieved in an individual may not have been high enough to overcome that level of resistance in that particular variant and the individual got sick. But I think we have to be very careful in not to blow this out of proportion that these are very rare individual cases and that the vast majority of individuals who are infected with the coronavirus and who've received a Pfizer mRNA vaccine are adequately protected from the disease. When did coronavirus first enter your radar screen? When did you first start mm -hmm. hearing about this? Well, as everyone did uh, in, in December, late 2019, when we were hearing about these cases occurring in a small town known as Wuhan, uh, just coincidentally, that had special significance for me because I was scheduled to visit Wuhan in March of 2020 because part of my organization is based in Wuhan. So we were following it especially carefully. And as the uh, uh, story emerged, we realized that it was probably not safe for me to go there. So we, we canceled that trip. But actually what we were seeing also was the fact that this was not limited to Wuhan. This is spreading. We, had, we were very concerned about making sure that our colleagues who are based in Wuhan were safe and were able to uh, be protected uh, fr from, from this to the extent possible, to what we knew at that time. And then we, we had to understand the impact that this had, not just in China, but on a worldwide basis, especially with regard to uh, um, the ability for us to continue to produce our medicines uh, in, in sites around the world, uh, and also to make sure that we were going to be able to take appropriate steps to address this challenge that was becoming more and more apparent. It was going to be a worldwide challenge that we had to step up to meet. And of course, you have heard the argument uh, from many Americans, the vaccines are not safe. I'm not going to get one. Address yeah. that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that people are concerned about is that the, 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 the short period of time that it took to develop the vaccine, in the case of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, that was seven and a half months from the time the first person received that, one, of, one of the vaccine candidates to the time that it received emergency use authorization. That's an unprecedentedly short period of time. So people wonder, gee, what was sacrificed in trying to do that as quickly as, as possible? I had a first uh, hand uh, insight into that and I could tell you that no corners were cut. No measures were abandoned or compromised that would give us anything less than a full understanding of the safety and efficacy of this vaccine. And even though this happened in a short period of time, and, it, and that happened because in part, there were so many cases of COVID in the population were able to get the trials completed faster, 
that we, when we brought the application for emergency use authorization forward to regulatory agencies, that had all the information with the complete level of confidence that we knew that this, uh, this uh, vaccine had a favorable benefit risk relationship. We had a very, very good insight into the safety and not only we, but regulatory authorities around the world felt that the benefits vastly outweighed the risks and that this was, was something that was not only going to be useful, but absolutely essential in helping us end this pandemic. The Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine is a two-step process and the mm -hmm. vaccines need to be uh, kept in a cold temperature. Johnson & Johnson is one vaccine, does not need to be in a cold temperature. Why? Explain the difference as we look at some of the uh, vaccines mm -hmm. in one of your distribution facilities. All right. So for the mRNA vaccines, um, these are encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles, which are a bit unstable once they're thawed to room temperature. So they have to be kept at a low temperature. Now, when this was first being developed uh, at Pfizer and BioNTech, the conditions that were used were ultra low temperatures, minus 80 degrees Celsius. And so that was the, what, where we had the experience. And that's what once we got the EUA emergency use authorization, that's what we had to have, that's what Pfizer had to have all the sites adhere to, uh, keep it at that very low temperature until it was ready to be administered, it was then thawed and then administered. Since that time, the companies have had more of a chance to test the vaccine for stability at less stringent conditions. And actually, just recently, uh, the FDA and the European agency as well have now relaxed those requirements. So no longer does the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine have to be kept at minus 80. It can be kept at minus 20 for up to two weeks. And there are many more facilities around the country and around the world that have those resources. So it now can reach more places than it could before. And you talk about the distribution. It was an issue that came up yesterday on NBC's Meet the Press with the Secretary of State Tony Blinken, and he was asked mm -hmm. by Chuck Todd on the issue of the U.S. role in vaccine distribution globally. Here's part mm -hmm. of his interview. Chuck, I think we have a significant responsibility, and we're going to be the world leader on uh, helping to make sure that the entire world gets vaccinated. And, and here's why. Uh, unless and until uh, the vast majority of people in the world are vaccinated, it's still going to be a problem for us because as long as the uh, virus is replicating somewhere, mm -hmm. it could be mutating and that it could be coming back to hit us. But similarly, the world has a very strong interest in making sure that we're vaccinated because uh, the same thing applies. Uh, if the vaccine, if the virus is uh, replicating here and mutating here, that's going to be a problem for the rest of the world. So we've taken a leadership role already on day one. We rejoined the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. We are the largest contributor in the world to COVAX. This is the facility, the international facility to make vaccines right. more available, especially to low and middle income countries. Uh, we've worked uh, a very important arrangement with India, with Japan and Australia, the so-called quad countries, to increase vaccine uh, production around the world. And uh, we've made uh, some loans to our nearest neighbors. Mexico and Canada. As we get more comfortable with where we are in vaccinating mm -hmm. every American, uh, we are then looking at what we can do, what more we can do around the world. Dr. Rothenberg, can you elaborate on what the Secretary of State was talking about and specifically Pfizer's role in this global distribution? All right. I, I think Secretary Blinken described it very well. Um, there's a, a responsibility that, that, that Pfizer and large pharma companies that have vaccines have uh, to, to the world because unless this is something that is controlled on a worldwide basis, it's gonna con continue to have impact, not only in other countries, but in the United States, because we're so reliant upon one another for supplies and materials and trade. So I think this is very important. Th this could have been and, and was predicted that when you have initial production, not everyone could get it at the same time. So it has to be prioritized. We saw that in the United States where the first groups to be vaccinated were those that were most vulnerable. So the, the same kind of prioritization has to be considered in terms of saying, okay, who is going to be the next group to get this? Pfizer, even though it's a US-based company, it has an international scope and responsibility, and it recognizes this. And, and as a result, even before Pfizer knew the results of the clinical trial, it was scaling up 
mass production of the vaccine to do everything it could to make sure that if the, the vaccine worked and if it received emergency use authorization, that as many doses could go out as quickly as possible. In addition, Pfizer was upgrading its facilities, reaching out and using new facilities in order to produce more vaccines. Uh, in addition, one of the uh, uh, important steps that, that was actually prompted by the, the pandemic and this crisis was a willingness of competitor companies, other large pharma companies, to band together and work together and cooperate to produce the vaccine. So in fact, not only is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine being produced at those locations, but actually Novartis and Sanofi have offered their vaccine production facilities to upscale the production and make it more available on a worldwide basis. So I think that these are very significant steps that have been taken to address this very problem of meeting the needs not only of Americans, but of people around the world in developed and in developing countries to make sure that we're able to eradicate uh, this pandemic, just to end this pandemic, and to allow the economies to open, travel to reopen, and, and us to get back to our lives. Dr. Rothenberg, one final point, and then I want to bring in our viewers and listeners. Moving forward, whether it's a treatment for cancer or future vaccines, what are the lessons over the last 12 to 13 months in developing the COVID vaccine? Mm -hmm. One of the, 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 the early decisions that was made at Pfizer was to initiate something called Project Lightspeed. And that took a look at every step along the way of clinical development, a process that takes years for medicines or vaccines, and to see what could be done to shorten that. Processes that were done in sequence, could they actually be overlapped or even done in parallel? What would be the risks? What would be the benefits? And, and so what a process that would normally take years was then truncated to seven and a half months in the case of the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, communication across organizations within the company was absolutely essential. Everyone recognized, because what the CEA, CEO laid out very early on was that this was the highest priority for the company. So whenever anyone called up to, uh, to address an issue uh, related to, to the vaccine, uh, people stopped what they were doing. They took the call, they entered the meeting to be able to manage problems in real time, to keep things going, to make sure this was everybody's top priority. That was an important lesson as well. What was also learned is that in, 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 in dire situations like this, that others beyond just the company are willing to interact in, in a, a more real-time basis. So when Pfizer reached out to the FDA, um, to request a, a meeting to get guidance on the next step for the vaccine's development or a question that it had, rather than having to submit it in writing, prepare a briefing document, get it scheduled, a process that could take four to eight weeks, uh, the call was actually responded to immediately or it was responded to later on that day. So you could see when you have everyone recognize that this is such a high priority, it has such meaning no matter where you sit in this ecosystem, that you could really band together and you could really get things done quickly and at high quality without sacrificing any element of quality or safety. We are talking with Dr. Mace Rothenberg. He is joining us from Nashville, Tennessee, the former chief medical officer for Pfizer. He also was on the faculty of Vanderbilt University's Medical Center and before that, the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Let's get to your phone calls from Rochester, Michigan. Nancy, good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a question. Uh, my husband and I came down with COVID um, about two weeks ago. We're doing fine. Uh, we did not get a vaccination. We had put in for it. You know, we had changed our minds to get it, but it it was too late for us. We are, we are doing fine now, but I have a question. I was asymptomatic, so I got a test after he got, he got COVID, and I had it. Now that we're out, it's almost 14 days, and we're doing well. What do we do now? Do we need to go get vaccinated? I know we have some antibodies, but I don't know what the protocol is now. Thank you, caller. Get, get vaccinated. The reason being that your body, when it's exposed to the virus itself, 
will generate an antibody response that will help the body fight off that infection and also potentially repel it in the future. But what's been found is that the level of antibodies that are produced with a vaccination, especially in people who've had prior infections, is many fold higher, 10, 100 fold higher than what your body had generated to that natural infection. So that's one reason to get the vaccine. The second is we don't know how long lasting that immunity may be from that natural infection. So if it wasn't a very strong reaction, that uh, uh, antibody response could wane over time. What we, what we believe it, what it is the fact that with, with the vaccinations, it's not only the antibodies, which are the short-term way that your body manages and fights off a viral infection, but other elements, memory B cells, memory T cells, uh, helper T cells, are able to be trained and actually, even after the infection is gone, they stay around, and they stay around for a long time. How long, we don't know, but now data are coming out that they're around six months, they're probably around longer, and I think that for those reasons, even in people who have had the, 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 the virus and had COVID-19, it's still important for you to get the vaccination as well. A couple of comments on our Twitter page. This from Sheila, Dr. Rothenberg. Tell me these vaccine producers can predict adverse reactions to it five, 10 years down the road. The answer is that we obviously no one has five or 10 years experience with this vaccine because we don't have five or 10 years experience with this particular variant of coronavirus. But what we, we can do is to draw on prior experiences to understand that there are certain early side effects that have been characterized very well for this as well as all vaccines in the future. And then in very rare cases, will you see some late occurring uh, side effects? But I think every, every individual has to make up their own mind to, to, to weigh what we know about the, the disease of COVID-19, what that can do to you. Uh, it could not only make you sick, it could land you in the intensive care unit, um, it could cause not only a, a short-term but long-term disability, we're learning, and it can kill you. It's about, about a, a 1 to 2 percent fatality rate in the short term versus what we know about the vaccines. And when it comes to the mRNA, mRNA vaccines of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, those side effects are very well characterized. They, they are in the vast majority of cases are mild to moderate. So some rare cases, less than 10%, may be more severe, but they're transient, usually gone within 24 to 48 hours. And no individual has been documented to have died from receiving the vaccine directly due to the vaccine. So you have to weigh the uncertainty of what may happen five or 10 years from now with the very real and present danger of getting and dying from COVID-19. The choice is yours. And this from Deborah Lee saying, fully Pfizer vaccinated, zero side effects, have finally met and have been holding my one year old great nephew for the past week, no greater feeling. One of my hopes for him is he grows up and becomes a scientist. <laughs> Get back to your phone calls. Linda is joining us next. Good, oh, go ahead, did you wanna comment? Wonderful. I, I think that, that that's great. And I think we can't underestimate that impact of the, the vaccination as well. That it's not just simply saying, okay, you've gotten the vaccination, now continue to do uh, everything you're doing before you got the vaccination and, 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 and keep yourself separated and isolated. It, it really is beginning to uh, allow us to get our lives back to allow us to travel, uh, as the CDC has indicated, uh, now with a little bit more comfort, still with precautions. But it's really a very important step in allowing people to get their lives back. And it's not just the travel and seeing sights, but it's interacting with friends and family and having those experiences that have been denied for the past year. So let's not underestimate the value of that and the importance of, of that and the role of vaccine in allowing people to regain that. And to that, William from Connecticut says, thank you. In a text message, the first Pfizer dose is in, waiting for the second on April 19th. Bless those who worked on this technology for many years and then expedited the final research and the production. Let's go to Linda in Minneapolis. You're on the air with Dr. Mace Rothenberg. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I, I had a couple of a comment and a question. I'll, I'll make the comment. Um, you just spoke about uh, people being able to get together. By the way, I'm over 80 and have had 
two of the Pfizer things, and thank you very, very much. Um, but I'm one, I've noticed my friends, my contemporaries, have really, in my view, kind of opened up to doing things since they've been vaccinated. And I, I'm still kind of cautious. I wonder specifically about the... Um, uh, the gathering together in a small group to have dinner in somebody's home that kind of that kind of worries me i i'm like uh uh-uh. uh <laughs> but i know friends who are doing it now they're very eager to get together it's all very understandable next quest so i'd like your opinion on that and then the next question is what about a booster <laughs> or do we need one <laughs> thank you great questions and and congratulations you, you sound like you're doing great Um, So in terms of gathering together, this is something that I think as we go along, we're getting a little bit more experience with in terms of an epidemiologic perspective. So uh, I think everyone knows that there are certain high risk behaviors that still should be avoided. Gathering with large crowds, indoor, people not socially distanced, people who are not wearing masks. um, Those are things that, that should still be avoided. But if you are vaccinated, and you can uh, gather together with other people who are also vaccinated and socially distanced, that I think now we recognize is a lower risk situation. So I think that that's something, and, and this is something just to keep your eyes and ears open for, because as we get more experience and information, sometimes from real world experience, sometimes from clinical trials, we'll be able to give more specific guidance on this. So for everybody, it's kind of a gray zone now, and some people are more willing to push that than others, but I think just keep your eyes and ears open that there'll be more guidance on this. With regard to the booster, it gets back to a point that was made earlier. Uh, There's now data to to suggest that in in people, the the very strong levels of antibody persist at least six months. It's likely to uh, be found at 12 months as well. But what we don't know yet is, is that going to last a lifetime or is that going to wane over time? And if it does, does it now make somebody more susceptible to, to catching and coming down with COVID-19? And then a corollary to that is with the emergence of some of these resistance mutations, is that going to also uh, generate a need for a booster And would that booster be the same original vaccine or could the vaccine be modified? And I can tell you there are efforts underway now to evaluate a modified vaccine that can actually have even greater activity against some of those resistance mutations. So stay tuned for this, but there's a lot of work going on to answer that very question. Let's go to Chattanooga, Tennessee next. Marvin, good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. I would like I, I would like to ask a uh, question, but I would like to make a comment first. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was in the Vietnam 68, 69 when the Agent Orange was spread. This is something that, in my opinion, the government allowed to come into our bodies and to allow to exist for all these years. It's been 53 years, and I am still dealing with what our country has allowed industries and pharmaceutical companies because of greed and for for whatever to put into our bodies. Now, I had to preference that because over the years, I have become addicted to these things in my 70s. I have have realized that I am addicted to all of these medications that I cannot throw away until the day that I die. Now, as far as this COVID is concerned, as far as this particular vaccine is concerned, I hope that the general public will take it and decide whether or not we are going to live or we are going to die. Unfortunately, we've got information about the Spanish flu. Now, are the booster shots and the and the flu shots that are being taken today are still a result of the vaccination of the Spanish flu? That would be my question. Marvin, so, go, go, go ahead. ahead. We'll, we'll get a response, Marvin, thank you very much. And if you could also in your response, explain what a booster shot does. Yeah. So a booster shot is given after the initial vaccination, some period afterwards, either shortly, a month or two afterwards, or in, or in this case, three weeks afterwards, in order to enhance the body's immune response. Then there are booster shots that may be given later on, and those uh, can actually 
uh, once again, increase the body's level of immunity against a particular disease in case the, the immunity from the first vaccinations waned. So I think that, 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 uh, that, that that's the important uh, part of that. Um, it, it, interestingly, there is a report um, just recently um, of a blood sample being obtained from somebody who is alive during the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, and they're still able to detect um, uh, immune cells or antibodies against that original the Spanish flu. So there is evidence that bodies can actually retain memory against an infection for decades. So that's, that's very important to, to, to know. Um, and I think that this is something we have to recognize and now with, uh, we have much greater and more advanced technologies. So we can begin to say, are the levels in an individual adequate to protect them and to protect them against the variants that might be coming, come, evolving over the next few months and years, or at what point does the benefit of another vaccination um, really outweigh that, 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 that risk and that we should uh, proceed with that. And as a follow-up to that, this from one of our viewers on our Twitter page saying that how much did Operation Warp Speed weigh in on the development of the vaccine? Yeah, I think it had different impact uh, on different companies. Uh, Pfizer did not take any research and development contributions from the federal government. Uh, I think that really needs to be made very clear. Pfizer did have a contract and does have a contract with the federal government to purchase the vaccine if the vaccine was effective. If the vaccine didn't work, the one to two billion dollars that Pfizer invested in the research and development would be gone, would be a loss. So it was a decision that was made in order to maintain the, the speed of the, the program, the independence with adequate oversight. So Project Warp Speed also was in, involved in distribution of the vaccine once emergency use authorization was administered. Some companies uh, were, did receive assistance and, re and accept assistance for the research and development aspect of that. And some of those have actually made it uh, through the EUA process as well. Gustav Perna, the uh, head of Operation Warp Speed, addressing the issue of the emergency use authorization by Pfizer. Here's what he had to say. For seven months, we have realized the greatest public-private partnership in modern times. Doctors, scientists, researchers, factory workers, logisticians, and hundreds more have all come together for a singular purpose. That purpose, save lives and end the pandemic. We checked our egos at the door. We worked collectively to solve the problem, and we have achieved success, as was identified last night by the FDA when they approved EUA of the Pfizer vaccine. Now we'll begin distribution of safe and effective vaccines to the American people. You have heard me refer to today as D-Day. Some people assumed that I meant day of distribution. In fact, D-Day in military designates the day the mission begins. D-Day was a pivotal turning point in World War II. It was the beginning of the end. D-Day was the beginning of the end, and that's where we are today. That from last December, and one of the leading individuals behind the development of that vaccine is our guest, Dr. Mace Rothenberg, who is the chief medical, former chief medical officer for Pfizer. Back to your phone calls. Next is Greg joining us from Alexandria, Virginia. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking uh, my call. So my question, uh, so I've taken the vaccine, had good uh, uh, reactions to it. Thank God. I think the only uh, reaction I had was a, a headache after my second dose, and that was a Pfizer vaccine. But my question is related to um, vaccine-related deaths. What has been reported and what has been basically confirmed? I know the uh, Averis, I think that's how you pronounce it, they collect the information, um, and, uh, and, and, and basically, I think back in February, they reported maybe a little over 100 uh, confirmed deaths related uh, to the vaccine, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But my question really is, um, has there been any, um, I guess, evidence or data to suggest that there may be some underlying conditions, whether it will be health problems or maybe genes, that would otherwise make people not a good candidate for the vaccine. Greg, thank you. We'll get a response. Dr. Rothenberg. Yeah. 
Let me make it clear that when we're talking about the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, there have been no deaths have been reported to have occurred directly as a result of the vaccine and the vaccine alone. Okay? There have been deaths reported with other vaccines, and they're now beginning to look into the reasons for this, but I think that that really needs to be, be clarified. Um, and, and so the rest, the, the, the second part of the question was? In terms of long-term effects, yeah. So I think that the, the, the long-term uh, effects, most of the effects that are seen after vaccination are within the first 24 or 48 hours. Uh, they could be fever, headache, chills, fatigue, um, and those will have varying levels uh, of, of severity. Sometimes people do find that they interfere with their activities of daily living, but they usually resolve within 48 hours. Uh, in terms of the individuals who may be at higher risk for that, um, th there, it really hasn't been a pattern. It seems that younger people may have a higher incidence of those side effects than older people. Some have postulated that's due to their stronger immune systems and stronger immune reaction to the vaccine. But there, and then there have been some reports of individuals who've had allergic reactions a few minutes after receiving the vaccinations. Uh, they've had some little shortness of breath, some low blood pressure, but all of those have been able to be managed uh, um, very eff effectively, and those resolve within a matter of hours as well. Um, in it's doctor, very in, difficult. In, oh, go ahead. It's very difficult to, at this point, identify individuals who are at increased risk for those side effects, but there are some warnings and precautions about individuals who, who should be monitored uh, or, or considered carefully before they get a vaccine. I mean, I'm just curious, is the vaccine different for an adult than it would be for an infant or a child maybe between the ages of, of six to 12? Yeah, so it, it's the same vaccine, but obviously it would be a different dose. And that, that very trial of individuals, of, of children between uh, six and, and 12 uh, is underway right now with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Actually, uh, Pfizer has submitted a supplemental uh, emergency use authorization for the vaccine to be used in, in children 12 to 15 years old. And so when you think about those children who are 12 to 15, as well as the 16 and 17 year olds that were included in the original trial, that's about 9% of the US population. So when we talk about herd immunity, we have to talk about not just adults who are being vaccinated, but the entire population. And so now having data on younger individuals will really help us achieve that level of herd immunity throughout the population of all ages. We'll go to Vicki next in Austin, Texas. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I had my first uh, Pfizer vaccine, and I had uh, just zero side effects. And uh, today I go for my second one. When I um, thought about it, I'm 63. I thought that I should have had, you know, stronger side effects. That would have been correlated with having a, a stronger immune system and reaction. Um, but at the time, I was taking daily uh, ibuprofen and. Um, lorantadine for my uh, allergies and uh, uh, arthritis. Um, so uh, this last couple of days, I've been off of those in case they interfere. My question is, uh, do these interfere with your immune response and efficacy of the vaccine? And if so, should the public be more aware? Thank you. Yeah. Well, Vicki, I've got good news for you that the, the side effects you experience do not correlate with the immune response that your body may have. So you may have had quite a, a substantial immune response and really not felt anything. Um, with regard to pre-medication um, before the vaccine, there are some theoretical concerns that that might blunt the immune response, but there's really no hard data. So the, the recommendation has been for individuals to continue the medicines that they're taking, they're absolutely necessary, but not necessarily to start a medicine, you know, Tylenol, ibuprofen, in anticipation of having side effects from the vaccination, that shouldn't be done. But if you do have the side effects, chills or a fever, then you, can you take yes. medicine? Yes, you can. Let's go to uh, next caller in Marion, Iowa. Jody, good morning. Hi, Steve. Nice to have you back. Um, I wanted to call in to follow up on a couple of the calls I made and my decision to get the vaccine. Uh, not just for myself, but for my family. My father has cancer, et cetera. And what I found is I thank C-SPAN for the 
abundance of information and people representing the information like uh, the gentleman here and to gather my facts and determine whether or not I think it's safe to get the vaccine. And what I've determined is that the Pfizer for myself and my family is the best. I'm hoping to receive that May 1st. And I do and did have concerns over the Moderna vaccine from which I believe my 91 year old grandmother was affected gravely from. Yes, she did have underlying factors. She may even have had um, long COVID side effects when she was mild or asymptomatic um, a year ago. But um, I truly believe it's the best thing to do. And it's not for yourself, in the words of Rachel Maddow, who got her shot, I believe Friday, uh, do it for everyone else. So thank you very much, C-SPAN. Jody, thank you. If I could just comment on that, um, when I've been asked which by others, which vaccine should I take? My response has been the one that's offered because we, we could have our favorite and based on one piece of data or another, but the most important thing is to get vaccinated. Every single one of the vaccines far exceeds the threshold that was set by the FDA, by the CDC for what they would consider an effective vaccine. That original threshold was 50% efficacy. And I think when the, the, the vaccine was still under development, uh, those of us working at Pfizer speculated, what, what did we imagine? What could we hope for in terms of level of efficacy? And we speculated maybe 65, 70, even as high as 75%. So on that day, on November 8th, when the Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Committee met and, and, and revealed the data, that the vaccine was 95% effective, that just wildly exceeded our greatest expectations. But I think we have to recognize that all the vaccines that have been reported now have efficacy 70% and above, which is very substantial, can be very protective. So please, if you're offered any vaccine, take it. But to that point, Pfizer is a two-step process. So is Moderna, Johnson & Johnson is one vaccine. What's the difference? Yes. Yeah, it, it, re it really is the, the basis. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are in, encapsulated in their, their mRNA encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles. So it's the preparation and it's the way the vaccine works. The AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are DNA vaccines that are encapsulated in adenoviruses that infect cells and deliver the, the DNA into those cells. So there are different ways of achieving the same result. All the vaccines will cause the, your own body to produce little proteins that look exactly like the spike proteins that you've seen in this picture of the coronavirus. And that's what infects cells. And then the body recognizes those spike proteins, creates antibodies to those, and prevents the viral spike proteins from infecting the cells. So there are different ways of achieving the same goal. Les is next, joining us from Sandy, Oregon. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Uh, hello, doctor. Hello. <laughs> uh, my, my concern is um, I have a disease, an immune deficiency that's called IgG4. And I have to have fusions, and they're like $20,000 um, a fusion called Rituxan, but you probably know what that is. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, um, my concern is um, people that have IgG4 mostly are also Hispanic and colored. And my concern is their life. And they sometimes don't know that uh, this IgG4 is in their system mm -hmm. and it can cause uh, death because mm -hmm. what it does is it causes your lip nodes to grow and can cause tumors and uh, stuff like that. My concern is their safety and mine in getting the shot. I'm trying to pill right now so I can get that shot, but I, I'm, sometimes those pills cause a stomach cramp um, instead of getting the fusion. Thanks for the call. We'll get a response. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Rothenberg? One of the things that 
uh, I think everybody realizes is that there are a number of unanswered questions here in terms of people who may have an underlying condition or are taking certain medicines or have had some particular history um, and how that may impact the effectiveness of a vaccine or whether that individual uh, should maybe not take the vaccine. To date, uh, w there have been a number of trials that have been set up, and I would urge the, the caller uh, to reach out to their local medical center or university medical center to find out if they're studying this very question, because that's going to help uh, not only that individual, but others. So it, it's really important that we learn about some of these populations and whether uh, they get the full benefit of the vaccine, whether they're at any increased risk for the vaccine, whether they need a, a booster dose, et cetera. So I think that, that it, it's important for people to come forward, to be able to, to uh, receive the vaccine, but also for physicians and researchers to be able to take blood samples and, and see how well uh, an immune response they, they mount. So I, I think that we could learn a lot, but we don't have all the answers yet, but this is an opportunity for us to contribute to that body of knowledge. And to less than anyone else interested, the CDC on its website at cdc.gov has information, including the ingredients of the uh, Pfizer vaccine, a Q&A session on what you should look out for, and an overview on the safety issues involving the vaccine. Again, the website is cdc.gov. Let's go to Paul in Potomac, Maryland. You're next, good morning. Good morning. Uh, as, a, as a friend and uh, colleague of, of Mace Rothenberg at both uh, San Antonio and the National Cancer Institute, uh, I uh, hold a high regard for both Mace and uh, certainly uh, Pfizer. My wife and I were both extremely fortunate to get the Pfizer vaccine. I at the VA in Washington, my wife at Johns Hopkins in Howard County and we had had no ill effects other than maybe a sore arm for a couple of days. We've been feeling uh, very good ever since. And again, I just want to reach out to Mace and Pfizer to, for creating a, a fantastic vaccine in a short period of time. Uh, I was also at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. So again, I uh, feel very fortunate uh, to, for getting the vaccine, Mace. Well, thank you for calling on the, you, the friends and family line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, let me move on to uh, Maureen joining us from Illinois. Good morning, Maureen. Thanks for waiting. Hi. Hello, Dr. Rothenberg. Um, I just have a question. On the 19th of March, I had my first Moderna shot, and I'm due to get another one this coming Friday. After two days, I was bragging how nothing happened, and all of a sudden I had chills so bad I couldn't even get up to go in the bathroom, and I got sick for about a day or two, and then I started feeling better, so that was good. But the problem is, is I had a CT scan done last week, and it showed lumps under my, you know, lymph nodes under my armpits. And so the doctor was real, real startled, said I should hurry and get mammogram, and uh, mm -hmm. then maybe have a biopsy too right away. But then I found out that this can possibly cause these lumps under my breast, just, you know, from the injection. So I don't know which way to go. Should I get the shot on Friday or should I not? Or what should I do? I am scheduled to get a mammogram, but uh, I don't know what to do. Maureen, thanks for the call. Good luck to you, by the way. Maureen, thanks so much for calling because you raised a very important I issue uh, and one that's, that concerns many uh, individuals. Um, after people receive uh, a vaccination, usually in the upper arm and the deltoid muscle, in some individuals, that has caused lymph nodes to swell. And that's understandable because the lymph nodes are where the immune cells track. So in, in, in most people, that's not noticeable. Some individuals have had very significant and somewhat uncomfortable lymph nodes under their arm. But in individuals who may have a history of breast cancer, the lymph nodes under the arm are also a site where the breast cancer could recur. So that was of great concern to the individuals and to their physicians. And so as this was seen, people began to recognize this has been seen more and more. And the question was, what did it represent? Was it the breast cancer coming back? Was it simply the immune response to the vaccination? And thankfully, it was due to the immune response of the vaccination. And that just waiting a, a few days, 
those lymph nodes went down, and then there was no, nothing under the, 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 the arm that was of concern. So what, what, what the recommendations are right now is not to have a mammogram soon after the vaccine for that very reason, but to wait a short while, maybe a few weeks, maybe a month, that, that delay is not going to endanger your life from getting a follow-up mammogram, but it will allow them to have an accurate view of what's going on under the, under the arms in those lymph nodes. So thank you very much for raising that important point. And a very quick follow-up. If you get the Pfizer vaccine, you need to stay with Pfizer, correct? You cannot mix up the two. That's the recommendations. Um, there have been some situations where there have been um, uh, people who've gotten one and gotten the other by mistake and, and uh, the, the companies are following those individuals to see how they respond, how they do. But the recommendation is to stay with the one you started with. We'll go to Miguel joining us from Maryland. Good morning. Miguel, you with us? I'll try one more time for Miguel. Yes. Oh, I think we lost you. I'm sorry. Let's go to um, Alicia. Good morning. A Andrea is next from Connecticut. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, yes, I am so happy to talk to you. I have contacted the CDC, the Board of Health in our state, the NIH, and I can't get this answer. I know I'm, everybody is particular and their body is, you know, different from everybody else. I got the shot on the 25th. I have autoimmune issues. My doctors always said to me, your glass is half full. And if you get, you know, stressed out, it overflows. So I have seven autoimmune diseases, including mm -hmm. severe allergies. Um, so I have been on allergy medication for 30 years nonstop. I did stop it because I did read uh, Dr. Fauci's um, recommendation not to take any allergy medicine. It's a little difficult when you're on it constantly. So I stopped it about five days before. I stopped my NSAIDs. I stopped my prednisone six weeks when I had booked the shot. Um, so I got the shot. We drove home and immediately I could not get out of the car. My whole body was hit. And I kept saying, well, because I have a body that's attacking itself, was this the case that because something foreign came in and my body is already hyperactive and I didn't want to blunt the, uh, the shot with taking anything, I suffered. I suffered for four days and I finally called my doctor and she goes, take and said, don't be ridiculous. But I wanted to know because it's not really out there that people shouldn't be taking their allergy medication at least two days before and any, you know, prednisones or any auto suppressant drugs. Do yeah. you feel that that's possibly what happened to me because I have, an, have so many autoimmune diseases that my body just went crazy because it's already crazy to begin with? Yeah. Well, Andrew, Andrew, thank uh, you. Yeah, I'm so, so sorry to hear you had such difficulty uh, with the vaccination. I think you raised two issues. One is that everybody who gets the vaccine, any vaccine, should log in and register with V safe, the letter V and then the word safe. What that is is a centralized program uh, sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that actually asks you a very simple list of questions about side effects. And it really is only through this way that we'll be able to get a, a much larger experience and insight into the range of side effects that the tens of millions of people who are getting have gotten the vaccine are experiencing. So please, everybody who is getting vaccinated, please register with VSAFE. The second question is, is, and if I understand the recommendations correctly, is not to stop any medicines that you need to treat an underlying disease. Um, to, I think the recommendation is don't start taking it to try and prevent a side effect. But if you need it for treating underlying disease, by all means continue taking it because the potential risk of that in suppressing or blunting the immune response you get to the vaccine is theoretical. The risk of stopping a medicine that you're taking to keep an autoimmune disease is very real. So please be careful, work closely with your doctor. Hopefully your second shot will be easier than your first. Sharon is joining us from Florida. Good morning. You're on the air with Dr. Rothenberg. Did you say Sharon? Yes, good morning. Go ahead, please. Oh, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I'm, um, 
Early on, I checked on the CDC website about um, any people or categories that would be excluded from taking any of these vaccines, and I found six of them. And uh, most of them were autoimmune issues, and I'm number six with lupus. Now, I take infusions to suppress my immune system. Mm -hmm. It seems common sense to me, and it seems like a huge lack of information coming from anyone having to do with vaccines. Thanks, Sharon. We'll get a response. And the CDC has this on its website on the homepage at cdc.gov. Your response? Yeah. You, you, point that you made at the end, there's a lack of information. Um, so what I'd, what I'd really urge is to look into whether any local medical centers, university centers um, are actually looking at that because there are a number of trials that are being done to systematically evaluate people with autoimmune disease, with lupus, to see how do they tolerate the, the vaccine, how do they respond to the vaccine, um, what can be done to make sure they're able to keep that balance of controlling their autoimmune disease at the same time that they're getting the immune protection from the vaccine. It's a balancing act. And I think the, 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 the cautions right now is that we don't have information on these, and it should be a discussion with your individual physician about the risks and potential benefits in your particular situation. We'll go to Maria in Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Steve. Pardon me, so glad to see you back. So glad. <laughs> it's kind of what the lady just piggyback, let me piggyback on what she said about lupus. I'm a lupus patient, and I take the hydro. I also take Tegretol. I don't want to take the vaccine. I'm scared. I'm scared mm -hmm. to put all this stuff in my system. I go to the doctor Friday. And I've got to make a decision, but I feel like I don't want all this stuff mixed up in me with lupus and mm -hmm. having the, the, my seizures and Zoloft and all that. And maybe you can convince me because right now I'm just scared. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, again, I, I don't. I don't feel I need to convince you of anything, but really, just to ha have you have the information you need to make a decision that's right for yourself. I understand the concern when you have a, an immune system that's already revved up um, and it's 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 not functioning the way it should, and it's causing some harm. Um, you, one worries that that's uh, that that giving a vaccine in that situation is going to make things worse, but. Again, we don't have uh, clinical trials on this to address this specifically right now, but, but theoretically, this is something that's going to rev up the immune system, but in a way that's very different from the way it's been revved up for the immune uh, disease that, that you have. This is really focused on um, generating a, a particular protein that's associated only with the virus, so it's not going to be something that's going to attack normal tissues in your body. Um, and it's going to provide you with a, a level of protection. How, what level of protection, we don't know, because you are on these immunosuppressive agents. But this is something that, if you do participate in a clinical trial, we could find out, know more, and give more specific guidance to other people in your situation. With about a minute left, Deborah, last call, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Quick question. Yes, uh, I just have a question about the people that are not receiving vaccines. At what point will that affect the people that have received their vaccines? Is the, will the virus mutate to a point where we'll have to start the process all over again? Mm -hmm. And uh, this thank, is my question. Thank you, Deborah. We'll get a response. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's a very important question because in a way it's, it is a race. As more people are vaccinated, you shrink the pool of people who are still more susceptible to getting infected by the virus, um, and therefore you reduce the, the number of people in whom mutations could occur. So that gets back to the point of the fact that this is not just an American issue of getting all Americans vaccinated, but it's also a global issue because we are so connected. And the, the, the pools of unvaccinated individuals who may be in another country today could easily travel uh, back and forth. So I think it's really important for us to get as many people vaccinated around the world as possible to really put an end to this pandemic. And if I could follow up on one, one final point, because often drug companies are competing against each other. In this case, there's been a partnership between the pharmaceutical companies 
and the federal government. Moving forward, will this, will this change the way we're seeing these partnerships operate in another potential pandemic? Absolutely. A five-point plan was issued soon after the pandemic was called, really laying out how companies would be willing to share their knowledge, share their resources, share their expertise in order to band together against this pandemic. But, but it was recognized that this, this would be short-sighted to just make it specific for COVID-19, but actually how to use this level of cooperation to be able to be prepared for the next challenge we may face in the future. And it's not a question of if, but when. Our conversation with Dr. Mace Rothenberg. He is the former chief medical officer for Pfizer, joining us on this Monday from Nashville. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Steve.